Assalamu alaikum and good morning. Um, it's a Monday morning and quite a somber one um, again in the studio as today is the martyrdom of Imam al Kavan alayhi salam. There are many majlis going around um, the, the world at the moment mourning the Imam, peace be and blessings upon him. Do let us know on social media what you'll be doing to commemorate this sad occasion. Yeah, uh, and here to commemorate um, with us we have Sayyid Jalal in the studio with our holy Quran recitation with ayahs from Surah Fajr. Straight after that we have Brother Ibrahim Ansari in the couch of Daily Duas and today he'll be um, reciting um, a more important ziara of Imam Musa al we also have um, psychotherapist Sister Barak dropping by to discuss addiction. So if you've been affected by this, please do stay tuned. Looking forward to that. Today we also have your health questions and queries answered by Dr. Yasser Madhani with information on emphysemia and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We also have your fiqh questions and queries answered by our very own Sayyid Ali Nawab on the subject of qawa, fasting uh, and prayers. For competition details, please stay tuned with Brother Mustafa Khatib. The city of Karbala is home to tragedies, heartbreak, as well as treasures and wonders. Millions from around the world come to the sacred city with their prayers and tears. As well as being home to Imam Hussein Media Group, it's the home and resting place of Abu Abdullah al Hussein and his brother Abu Fadl Abbas. Imam Hussein sacrificed his life for the sake of truth and preservation of the religion and teachings of his grandfather, Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Imam Bakr says, Order our Shia to visit the shrine of Imam Hussein since doing so increases sustenance, extends life, removes evil, and that visiting the grave of Imam Hussein is a duty upon every believer who believes in Imamat from Allah Almighty. So we invite you to come to Karbala and come to visit your Imam and perform ziyara. Unfortunately, not everyone can come visit Imam Hussein. Not everyone has the ability or opportunity to visit regularly. And that's why Morning Baraka is giving you the opportunity to perform ziyara from your very homes. We want you to send in your duas and names of your loved ones so we can recite the ziyara of Imam Hussein alayhi salam on their behalf. Maybe you have a loved one whose name you want to put forward. A marhum who would benefit or maybe you miss Karbala and yearn to see Imam Hussein. Peace and blessings be upon him. Why not send a small message or a dua for us to read here in the holy city of Karbala. Whoever's name you put, whatever dua or small message you have, the morning barakah team will pass it on to our team here in Karbala and we will recite the ziyara, read the message and broadcast it on Imam Hussein TV3. Send in your names, duas and small messages to Morning Baraka at sign Imam Hussein TV or message us or leave a comment on any of our social media platforms. We look forward to hearing from you and may Allah and the Ahlul Bayt accept all of our a'mal and our ziyara, inshallah. Yes, welcome back. And to start uh, today's show, uh, today's blessed show, where we are commemorating the martyrdom of Imam al Kadhim, we're going to be hearing from the holy words of the Quran, um, from the voice of Sayyid Jalal Masumi. Sayyid, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sayyid, uh, inshallah, we'll be hearing from your voice uh, in terms of the chapter. It's chapter of Fajr, so Surah Al Fajr, um, verses 15 to 30. Please, Bismillah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم
فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا ما ابتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون ولا تحاضون على طعام المسكين وتأكلون التراث أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما كلا 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 إذا دكت دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وَجِئَ يَوْمَئِذٍ بِجَهَنَّمَ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنْسَانِ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَتَذَكَّرُ يذكر الإنسان وأنا له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوثق وثاقه أحد يا أيتها النفس
ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرج محمد وآل محمد Yes, many thanks, Sayyid Jalal, for that beautiful rendition um, of Surah Al-Fajr, verses 15 to 30 in the Holy Qur'an. Many thanks for your time. Um, to, which brings us nicely uh, onto the, um, this segment of, of the show where we are really taking a deep dive into the supplications, the du'as, um, the ziyaras associated with the Ahlul Bayt salam, and trying to shed light um, on some of the key benefits of these ziyaras and, and supplications and du'as uh, as well as maybe some facts that you didn't know about that could be a benefit to you. Um, myself and Zara, welcome as always um, Ibrahim and Ansari um, to the show. Uh, Ibrahim, as-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. Um, it's always a pleasure um, yeah. to, to have you khair. It's my show. pleasure we to be here. A lot of interesting conversations and today inshallah we'll, 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 we'll have another uh, interesting uh, conversation. But before inshallah. we do start, and I'm sure that we all know um, it is the martyrdom of Imam al kazim alayhi salam. Um, so we send our condolences to the Muslim world um, on this tragic event. We will delve into a lot more about this um, this event and this tragedy during the show. So, yeah. um, Zahra, Ibrahim, sorry. To be honest, mm. can I ask a question? Yes. Mm. Um, I think when we talked about the martyrdom of Imam al kazim and we said that um, we're going to be speaking about Imam al kazim today, mm. Zahra's facial expressions changed. Um, it seemed as if she had a direct connection with the Imam. Mm. Um, she remembered the Imam and I feel as if her eyes got a bit teary. Mm. So my question to you is, what happened there? Um, I think his story is painstaking and painful. It's yeah. just, when you look at, recall how he was, although it's beautiful in some ways, when he said, you know, he talks about his time in the prison, that I, like, I got this opportunity to pray to you yeah. and serve you, and in, in, in what most of us would feel, you know, it's hell being in a prison. Mm. But then his end, where he says to his followers, um, tell my Shia that they will see me on Wednesday. Yeah. And I think, to, he obviously didn't explain how they would see him, but to imagine that he's on the bridge where they couldn't even tell there was a body. And mm, you think, yeah. what did he go through? Yeah. Um, but an embodiment of patience. And again, Ahl Bayt have so many lessons to teach us. And, and really in the short life, it doesn't matter how many times we go over and over because we are still growing um, to reach that level of any perfection, in, you know, a minute percentage of it, but they were perfect. And what beautiful examples God has given us. So it was just that yeah. thought that, you know, there's a lot of stories that we hear about Imam al Kazim as well yeah. throughout, I mean, during his time when he was taken from prison to prison and each prison got, you know, worse and worse. worse. The situation was worse and worse. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely... Yeah. And, and I was just, as you were talking, I was just thinking these, these Imams, um, on a general sense, mm -hmm. we, although we haven't met them, but we just want so much care um, 
and we just want them to be to be safe and we yeah. just want them to be um you know we we want to look after them we want to make sure that they 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 they're safe and they and they're peaceful um but the stories that we hear for example imam al hussein and salam the rest of the imams and especially when it comes to imam al kadhim the thought of him going through pain it's for example if if with your father or mother or even grandfather or even to a certain extent some of the maraja some of the scholars yeah. we have so much love and devotion towards them the thought of them going through a painful experience pains us yeah. so imagine what it's like for 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 an imam no, uh, definitely. we take quite the imam imam al kadhim um a lot of people focus on the end of his life yeah. and a lot of people focus on him from uh, after he goes into prisons mm. okay. but he has such a great status and even by the death of his father he actually went through some kind of oppression the oppression he went through was that his elder brother mm -hmm. tried to take imama mm -hmm. and the khalifa of the time may Allah withdraw his mercy from him he, he said he tried to bring in the Ismaili sect, who's also his brother. Although Ismail had died about 20 years before that, mm -hmm. maybe a bit less, and they tried to renew it to make sure that he doesn't get the Imam. Whereas Imam al Sadiq, he was very smart in, 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 how, in how he approached the situation mm -hmm. during his lifetime. Where when the Imam was five years of age, which Imam? Imam al kadhim okay. when he was five years of age, his father, Imam al-Sadiq, some of the questions he was asked, he would refer yeah. them back to Imam al kadhim at five years of age. Mm -hmm. For example, for example, the biggest question, or one of the biggest questions he was asked at the age of five was by Abu Hanifa, mm -hmm. Abu Hanifa al numan He comes to him and he says, what do you say? Does a man have free will or not? Yeah. At the age of five. He replies by saying this splits into three categories. Either God is making man do it. Two, both God and man are doing it together. Or three, no, man has free will and God has no hand in it. He says, if we take the first, then God cannot punish his servant for something he forced him to do. Mm. If we take the second, then God cannot punish his servant for something he was a partner in. Mm. So therefore, it leaves us with the third, which means that man has to have free will. And another state where you realize the taqwa of Imam al kadhim is when he stands praying in front of an open door. Again, Abu Hanifa comes. Abu Hanifa goes to Imam al-Sadiq and he says to him, do you not tell us to not pray in front of open doors? Why is your son doing it? Imam al-Sadiq looked at him. He said, am I praying in front of the open door or is my son praying in front of the open door? He said, no, your son, but you told us not to do it. Why don't you tell your son? He said to him, if it is my son doing it, then go to my son and ask him why. Yeah. He went to Imam al-Kadhim and he said, because God is closer to me than that though. Mm. This is the taqwa of Imam al-Kadhim. This is Imam al-Kadhim from a young age. Imam al-Sadiq showed that he was ready yeah. for such, such a status of Imam. Of course, the caliphs didn't like it. Yeah. They didn't like it at all. And they, 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 for example, at, after the istishhad of Imam al-Sadiq, by the hand of the caliph of the time, he sends a letter to Wali al-Madina. And he says to him, uh, kill all of those who, who Sadiq has put in his wasiyya to be after him. Imam al-Sadiq had, had written that the first is the Khalifa. Mm. The second is Wali al-Madina. The third is Abdullah. The fourth is uh, a lady. Uh, I forgot her name. And the fifth is Imam al kadhim Now he can't leave the first four and go to Imam al kadhim straight away. Yeah. So he said, no, then leave it. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. They tried it from, from as soon as Imam al-Sadiq passed, passed away. They tried to, to, to kill the Imam. Mm. They, they weren't able to. Then that is when after, after time they took him. Uh, when Harun al-Rashid came, may Allah withdraw his mercy from him. The reason he took him was this. When he heard of the great status of Imam al kadhim he goes to the grave of Rasulullah. And he goes to the grave and he says to him, Assalamu alayka ya am. Peace be upon you, O uncle. To show that he has direct relation to Rasulullah. Why? To try to minimize the status of Imam al kadhim when Imam, when he did that, Imam al-Kadhim was at the grave of Rasulullah. He said, Assalamu alayka ya jid. 
Peace be upon you, O grandfather. Then Imam al kadhim turns around to Harun al-Rashid and he says to him, if Rasulullah was to come right now and ask for your daughter's hand in marriage, would you give her to Rasulullah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, yes. He said, you see, that's the difference. Yeah. <laughs> because for me, I cannot give her as it's mahram. Yeah. yeah. He was taken Wisdom. to prison. Wisdom. Just that, you know, you look at their ages and when you talk about, you know, the five-year-olds, you think, subhanAllah, like, even the children in Karbala, they weren't, you know, like the children that we have today, five years old. It was mm. such, you know, pearls of wisdom. It's amazing. But yeah. I'm just conscious that the ziyara yeah. you need to recite. So would <coughs> yeah. you like to? So the ziyara of Imam al-Kadhim, alayhi salam. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله وابن وصيه السلام عليك يا مولاي يا موسى بن جعفر ورحمة الله وبركاته أشهد, أن أشهد أنك قد بلغت عن الله ما حملك وحفظت ما استودعك وحللت حلال الله وحرمت حرام الله وأقمت أحكام الله وتلوت كتاب الله وصبرت على الأذى في جنب الله وجاهدت في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاك اليقين وأشهد أنك مضيت على ما مضى عليه آباؤك الطاهرون وأجدادك الطيبون الأوصياء الهادون الأئمة المهديون لم تؤثر عمن على هدى ولم تمل من حق إلى باطل وأشهد أنك نصحت لله ولرسوله ولأمير المؤمنين وأنك أديت الأمانة واجتنبت الخيانة وأقمت الصلاة وآتيت الزكاة وأمرت بالمعروف ونهيت عن المنكر وعبدت الله مخلصا مجتهدا محتسبا حتى أتاك اليقين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد It's very interesting because when you visit um, the, the, the shrines of Imam al kadhim and Imam al-Jawad, who are buried right next to each other, yeah. um, sometimes you find in one corner there could be a, a joint ziyara. Yeah. So it's speaking to both imams at the same time. And I think sometimes you find another door which um, is a ziyara specifically for Imam al kadhim yeah. another door specifically for Imam al So this one is speaking specifically about? This is specifically to Imam al kadhim alayhi mm -hmm. alayhi wasalam. So they do have, they both have specific ziyaras. Yes. And they have a joint ziyara yeah, as well. Do, yeah. Yeah. So this one is directly to Imam al kadhim mm -hmm. alayhi alayhi wasalam. And in terms of the, the, the language as well, we, 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 talk, we talk a lot during, during yeah. these segments about mm. the language that's used um, in the previous uh, uh, couple of sessions uh, for the martyrdom, Imam of, the martyrdom of um, Sayyidah Zainab alayhi um, salam. The words and the language used was very descriptive, very yeah. um, out of the norm when it comes to usual ziyaras. Yeah. Obviously, because it reflects her, her story, her tragedy. Yeah. When it comes to this specific ziyara, it's a bit more Generic, oh, isn't it? Yeah, it's a bit more generic, a bit more of a mm. normal, as this, we could say, ziyara, right? Yeah, this is more of the, let's call it the traditional yeah. Yeah. way of ziyara. Yeah. So you, when you do ziyara of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, it's very similar. Mm -hmm. The ziyara of Aba al Fadl al Abbas, yeah. mm -hmm. very similar. It's, it, it follows yeah. that, that sort of um, way. However, we must not undermine this no. way because, first of all, um, you are sending your salams to people who are definitely ahya. And the Rabbihim Yurzaqun, just like the Quran said, that, that do not count those who have died in the way of Allah to be dead. Yeah. Instead, they are alive yeah. by their Lord, receiving great bounties. Yeah. And also, because these ziyaras, they show the statuses of the Imams. So, for example, in one part, he says, Nasahta lillahi wali rasulihi wali amir al mu'minin. It means that throughout his life, the only way he was going in, the only way he was advising in, was advising towards the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which he sent through Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, it also gives mention to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn mm -hmm. Abi Talib, mm -hmm. because he is the one who allowed this message 
to carry on as well. So that is very important to understand how he lived his life. Yeah. Mm. That even in, in prison, because we know, in, for example, in Basra, mm. the, the person who was in charge of, of the prison, he said, I cannot keep him anymore. Because I can see nothing but piety from him. Yeah. Then they moved him to another prison in Baghdad. And that prison in Baghdad, the person who was in charge of it, he actually became a Shia of Imam al mm. And in the worst prison that he was sent, which was guarded by a Sindhi, yes. even then, one of the guards was actually a Shia of Imam. And to prove it, the guard actually comes. Imam al kadhim by the way, played a great role in teaching us taqiyya. He played one of the biggest roles of the Imams of teaching us how to perform taqiyya. Mm -hmm. One of the gods comes to the Imam and he says to him, Oh Imam, I have... Uh, sorry, the Imam comes to him. He says to him, come. He says, I think Harun al-Rashid is looking to behead you and is looking for an excuse. If you are Shia, you're going to be beheaded. Therefore, when you go, do your wudu. When you go, do your wudu. Mm -hmm. By the way, this explanation at the start is from me. Mm -hmm. He says to the, uh, to the God, he says, when you do your wudu, wash your feet and do not wipe them the way that they do. Okay. Yeah. Wash your feet and do not wipe them. So that day, Harun al-Rashid has had God to overlook this God for when he performs his wudu. Subhanallah. He went and they saw that he washed his feet instead yeah. of wiping them. They said, no, he's from our people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they left him alone. Then he came back and he said, next time when you do your wudu, start wiping again. Mm. Such imams of mercy, really. Yeah. I think uh, we're towards the end of the time now. Yeah. Sorry. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before That's all. Ali? You? Just no. lastly, yeah. from from his name, Kadhim Al Ghayth, we must take that as a lesson. Just yes. his name in itself is a lesson. Kadhim Al Ghayth is a person who keeps an anger from great tragedies that befall upon them. So if he was able to do so, we must take him in Alakum fi Rasulillahi Uswatun Hassana and likewise in his household. So inshallah we can all remain patient and follow the footsteps of the Imam. Inshallah. inshallah. And that's easier an, said than done, yeah. but it's definitely mm, that's massive an, life lessons and yeah, yeah, definitely things definitely. to take forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I personally learned so much. It's just so beautiful to have the conversations about Ahl Bayd and I hope the viewers enjoy um, these um, discussions as much as I do, and I hope, you know, inshallah, I'm Ali very does much as well. So. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, have a blessed I still day. have, by the way, like three or four more questions, but it's just a time oh, that doesn't yeah. permit yeah. us, but inshallah, we'll, we'll carry on. Inshallah. Yeah. inshallah. Inshallah, definitely. So uh, yeah, on that note, um, um, we will be joined by Barack Hussein as well as Zara, uh, who will be focusing on the specialist segment. Um, so please join us after the break. My heart like an orphan's at your touch It softens and my love it becomes Hussein With everything patient With your love impatient daily Welcome back, dear viewers. Um, we just had um, Brother Ibrahim Al Ansari um, talking and reciting um, the, the ziara of Imam Al Ghazim. Um, I hope that you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, it's very refreshing. And something else now, the topic that we're going to go into in this segment um, is something that's more of a social aspect that can affect us in different ways at different stages in our life as well. Um, the topic is addiction. And joining us this morning, as ever, um, is our wonderful sister Barak Hussain, um, who's from Canada and and, um, is a psychotherapist and you can find her on social media under the, the Muslim counsellor. So join me in welcoming Sister Barak Hussain. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum as -salam. How are you this morning? Alhamdulillah yourself. You look mashallah, very refreshed and you know ready for this topic. Inshallah. And enlightening Inshallah. Us. Um, so usually you would think about addictions and we and I will speak as a person as a lay person that you know perhaps alcohol, drugs, cigarettes come to mind um, and I don't know what the causes of these kind of addictions are, what prompts people to 
go down those routes. But perhaps you can give us a bit of background, um, what kind of cases you see, what addictions are sort of things that perhaps we don't always think about. Like I've given the top ones that I can think of the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But what, what do you see in your sort of career and, you know, your professional life? It's true. When people think about addictions, the idea of alcohol and drugs come to mind. There's also gambling mm -hmm. and there's also pornography. So it doesn't necessarily mean just substance abuse. So the idea of an addiction is that you need a certain substance or you need a certain thing um, that will satisfy your need, okay, mm -hmm. uh, to, to fulfill yeah. it. And so when initially, how does an addiction occur? And I hear this from my clients, for example, when it comes to uh, substance abuse, is they're at a party, they're at a get together, and it could be both Muslim, non-Muslim, different mm. background people. And uh, it's a social situation where there's marijuana. And so they will smoke a joint, you know, just socially. And I, I heard one client say, I enjoyed it, so then I started doing it. Right. So then it became a routine and a habit, mm. and I cannot sleep without doing it. I cannot relax without doing it. And so the idea here is that in his mind, if I do not take this substance, I will not relax, I will not sleep. And so... It's the dependency the on that. The dependency mm. begins, because he said it became a habit, a routine. Yeah. So what happens here physiologically, <clears throat> excuse me, and at the chemical mm. level here in the body, um, you get the chemicals in your body which give you that release. You like that feeling. Mm -hmm. So you want more of it. Mm. You take more, it doesn't give you the same feeling, the same amount. So you take more, right? That doesn't give you the satisfaction. More, more. So the hit gets higher and higher in order to, to reach that demand. And when it does, it's never enough. Hence it becomes an addiction. Okay, and it becomes more regular? Routine, so you, you, regular you, habit. Like they then, we, like you said, it becomes a dependency. They yeah. rely on that for that satisfying feeling, but it's never enough. So this is where you get yeah. into overdose. This is where right. you get when we talk about alcoholism. It, it can be mm. destructive, mm. especially um, from a, a health perspective, where yeah. you're destroying your liver with yeah. the alcohol, for example. So. There's so many different levels to it, different types of drugs that some, you know, some would think uh, that, you know, smoking a joint once a week is harmless. But in fact, the THC levels of the chemicals that are into your body with that one joint is enough to trigger anxiety. One joint, yeah. anxiety. And so people take marijuana thinking that it's going to reduce their anxiety. Right. If they take, this is one joint and yeah. it will trigger it. It'll stay in your body for a week. Wow. So one joint, yeah. imagine people who take it daily and multiple times a day, what is it doing to you? In your mind, you think it's relaxing you. But in fact, these chemicals stay in your body over such a long period of time, mm. and it becomes the triggering effect for anxiety, for example. Oh, goodness, so it's almost like a double barrel. Exactly. Um, you know, you're not, you're, you, the substance that you actually take. are taking are, is fueling what you're already Yeah, so fueling. what you're taking then becomes the trigger. Yeah because you need it to feel better, but it actually, chemically, it's making you feel worse. So you mentioned different types of um, addictions of substances. Um, so alcohol, drugs, oh, they're quite common ones. This is what of. we understand. We understand, and, and may perhaps naively, we think it doesn't happen in our community, but we've had questions yes. of thick with our previous seasons where people, you know, perhaps spouses are concerned that the husband is drinking, and, you know, do those actually exist in our community? Of course they, they do. do. They do. Yeah. Uh, just as in any community, we're not immune. No. I mean, we have boundaries and rules to help protect us, which is why uh, alcohol yeah. is forbidden for yeah. us, right? So people still engage in that behavior, but secretly. Mm. Some are who, you know, are far away from the religious community will publicly do it. Yeah. Um, but that's their choice in their lifestyle. Um, but people who ha are, are with the people who are living in a, an addictive situation will keep it hidden, right? right? And even like I said, in the non-Muslim communities, yeah. alcoholism is very prevalent. Yeah. And it, people try to pretend that they're functioning well while under the influence, while they're driving, while they're working, we know what can happen with yeah. the driving. Yeah. Because they, they show, yes. they've become so accustomed to the alcohol in their system, mm. they can, in their mind, they feel that they can function normally with it. Because for them, it's just like taking um, you know, a painkiller to reduce mm. the effects of that. So people get addicted to it starting off just as a social thing yeah. and then it becomes a habit for them and it becomes a dependency and they feel they cannot live without it. 
I've got lots of young people that come to mm. me of Muslim background as well mm. who come seeking support and say, I don't want this to be part of my life. I know, you know, we've got the layer of the Islamic um, yeah. issues here that I know what I'm doing is haram. I don't feel that I'm worthy to pray or wear the hijab or go to a mosque because I'm doing these things. And so it's an added layer, an interesting mm. uh, discussion to have, you know, with the, with the, the student. The guilt as well. The guilt, the guilt and the is, shame, yeah. right? Because the, now it's become an illness. It's yeah. an addiction. It also impacts their, their yeah. life, academic life, yeah. their social life, the family life, especially if the family finds out. It's a, it's, it's it's a big deal. A, it's a spiral, downward spiral, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. It's a shame because I, I, obviously when you speak to young people and they talk about perhaps, you know, I can't wear hijab, I can't go to the centre, I won't be welcomed, I have this. But actually, Allah is so merciful that he covers our sins. And even if we get to that point that we are doing things that we can't control, we perhaps need the help of experts like yourself to be able to learn how to control our mind, our willpower, and not succumb, succumb to haram. Um, but that we shouldn't alienate ourselves from a center because it could be that light enters us and shaitan plays with our mind, doesn't he? That, no, don't go because... Um, but yeah, we should never lose hope in God, I think is one of the you know, key Absolutely. elements. Absolutely, and, and he tells us he's the all-forgiving. And I use these yeah. uh, concepts in, yeah. in our therapy depending on the Who client, is, and depending yeah. if they are yeah. wanting this yes. type of therapy. So it's very soothing and comforting yeah. when they hear that. You know, you repent, yeah. you do not repeat, yeah. you are forgiven. This is what we know. Yeah. And so that can be part of the therapy to help them along the way. It's, it's interesting what you said that, you know, the place where they could find that spiritual connection yeah. and redemption, they ban themselves yeah. because they feel they're not worthy. worthy so we work on that. We yeah. work on the worth. Now, I'm not a specialist in addictions. Yeah. Again, I do have connections in, the, in my community yeah. where I would refer students mm. because it's a specialized area. Yeah. And even here in London, again, I... I would recommend that people who are struggling with this to call the Muslim Youth Helpline okay. and they will direct them to the appropriate referrals here as well. Definitely, if I feel that, you know, people feel that they need the help. Um, you know, often, in, in what's interesting in, in considering what our previous mornings have been discussing different topics and the dependency that people, you know, it's, it's almost like the trigger. Is it, is it stress? Is it something that we're not managing and then something gives us that temporary relief and that we're relying on that substance? Um, and in this case, we talk about di addictions. But yes. is that what's taking people away from normality and the stressful normality they have? Well, stress is, uh, it can kill you, as they say, if mm. you don't take care of yourself in so many different ways, right? Mm. And just to backtrack a little bit when it comes to mental health and awareness and education, yeah. um, some people are predisposed, meaning they have genetic uh, hereditary factors in their right. family where yeah. they could be predisposed to certain illnesses, mental illnesses, just like physical illnesses, yeah. right? Like diabetes, cardiovascular, mm. high blood pressure, low mm. blood pressure, things like that, anemia, um, so some people could be predisposed to depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar disorders. So it's there. However, there could be they could be living their lives normally, and yeah. nothing in particular is happening to mm. elicit or trigger their uh, illnesses. So they could be living for a long time, nothing right. happening to them. Everything's great in their lives, right. and then subhanallah, suddenly like this, a certain stressor could come and trigger that, wow. right? And so this this is also related to yeah. substances as well, or rather addictions, mm -hmm. where let's say they are uh, triggered by a certain stressor and the comfort that they found. We talked about different mm -hmm. ways. We mm -hmm. talked about eating disorders. We talked about how people become socially isolated yeah. to deal and cope with these illnesses. Another, another direction people could take is through addictions, that a stressor could be triggered where they find that the best healing or coping is using substances or gambling or pornography to give them that relief. Um, in terms of the environment people are raised in, um, do so say if you had a parent that was an alcoholic or was, um, was somebody that had depression, you saw how they dealt with their stress levels and perhaps, you know, I mean, now we're talking about mental health has such an emphasis in society. It still needs a lot of work, but it's a lot better than it was, say, 30 years ago. That somebody's being raised in an environment that was very negative and very emotional driven. Um, would they pick up those sort of habits or is it something that we're capable of saying, no, that's not how I want to behave or should behave? Or can you actually develop those 
by mean, looking at behaviors that you're going to be copying as a... You mean like taking on addictive behaviors? Yeah. The, the problem here is how accessible drugs are, for example, mm. or how accessible gambling or access to pornography is. That's the issue these days. Yeah. It's not so much, oh, I am not going to be doing this. It's so easily accessible. Mm. It becomes you and your willpower and your choice to do it. I'll give you an example. Uh, a few years ago in Ottawa, we had a big conference, uh, sorry, not Ottawa, Montreal, uh, Sister Fatima Ali, um, organized a conference on drugs in the community. And we had big speakers like Hassan and Rajab Ali, um, Dr. Tim Sharp, and Alvin Pal Palvin, if I remember the name correctly, who was an ex-football uh, player. Football is an American football, not yeah, to British. Yeah. <laughs> and he became highly successful in his sport, but became highly addictive with his success right. to drugs. Right. And he crashed and failed and just lost everything and he came to share his story with us and he was an inspiring speaker and some of the, because he now has he's has a, is a reformed addict so mm. to speak a recovered mm. rather mm. addict and he gives talks and helps young people and families and mm. one of the statistics that he gave us which was very shuddering to think yeah. about and to parents who was and i remember the parents in the room they they could not believe it wow. He said, children as young as eight, nine years old have access to drugs. Gosh. And when you think about it, well, how is that possible? Yeah. Well, let me tell you how. And he described it, and it's very frightening. He goes, when you leave them or they go to the bus stop, there could be some people yeah. around there of influence. When they're dropped off at the school, before they get into the school, that area, they could be, you know, Definitely the influences approach. could be there. Yeah. During the breaks, they could walk off uh, school property. There's some time there where they could do that, lunch yes. as well. After school, when you're not home on their walk back or drive back home or from yeah. you know, the school bus, there's that time frame where they, and you think about it, you're like, wow, yeah. that, that's actually true. Yeah. So it's so important as families to have that discussion. You know, there's been huge campaigns over the years. I know, I remember growing up in Canada, just say no, yeah. no to drugs. Yeah. There's huge yeah. campaigns and you hear little lingo yeah. songs that play in your head, but there's so much to that because Saying yes to it the first time could potentially, that's all you need to get hooked, especially if you have a, an yeah. addictive nature where yeah. when you like something too much, like we've got these fruits here, you could be of an addictive nature where you love these clementines. Oh, One is not I'm enough. <laughs> I'm saying for an example, yeah, right? Absolutely. You could sit and polish off eight yeah. because you've got that addictive nature. Yeah. You enjoy, you like, you, you don't stop. So you could be of that nature and then you're exposed to this. And then you just start. And then the description that we did earlier yeah. about, you know, the hit is not enough. That's how it can develop. Um, just quickly, we have run out of time, but I do want to touch on, so you talked about alcohol and drugs. I understand that, but how does pornography come into that? That there's just that, how does a hit get higher and higher and something like that? And it is happening. It's prevalent mm. within our communities in both men and women. These statistics mm. come uh, from the Muslim Youth Health Line. We were discussing right. that the other day, yeah. and they've had more calls from young women as well. Right. And so there's a variety of causes. First and foremost, the lack of proper sexual education yeah. in our community. Um, people pulling kids out of programs that are already in schools, mm, for example, yeah. but they're not providing them with a the proper alternative. alternative. Yeah. That's huge. I know in our community it's it's shameful, it's taboo. Yeah. The reality is that's culture. Is Religion yeah. talks about this. There are books, there are scholars, our imams, the prophet, all talk about uh, sexual relations yeah. within a marriage in a healthy manner. But we don't talk about this openly with our kids. So what happens to the young boy or girl who become aware of their sexual desires? They're growing older, which is normal and natural. Mm. And we need to be aware of how to teach our kids about these things in a way where they don't deviate when they are feeling this and, and want to find release and relief. Yeah. Because it's a natural human instinct, subhanAllah. Yes. So, and we are taught how to manage it in a healthy way. Mm. So they resort to finding out or learning about sexual education through what is easily accessible yeah. on the internet, on the phone. Yeah. So for example, even kids who, let's say, look at innocent YouTube videos of so cartoons and songs, yeah. you can see around YouTube and parental lack of parental control here um, when you, yeah. know, you give the phone to your child, they can easily yeah. access all sorts of all things. Sorts. They could go to these by accident mm. and continue watching what is this, what is this, they become addicted again the process we discussed mm. so it could happen that way i i see a lot of people who come to me and struggle with this it's, again it's yeah. not a specialty of mine no. but we talk about all right thank you for coming yeah. bless you for coming especially muslim students where they come and say i know this is haram but, i'm ashamed yeah. of this i and they're practicing muslims in the sense that 
they're doing everything else, but they're struggling with this and they don't want to do it. No. So uh, we're very blessed in our community that we have some young sheikhs who um, are very supportive. And so I, I would connect with the sheikhs and say, would you be open to talking to this? They want to work on it from a spiritual angle while I connect them with the appropriate you know, yeah. sexual addiction uh, counselors that we have um, in our community. Fortunately, this is all we've got time for. I keep getting notified. Time's up. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it's a topic in itself, isn't it? That Absolutely. I think something that I've learned um, really is speaking to you is that we can't really be in denial that these things, if they're happening in society, probably they're happening in our communities. And not to think that We're faith immune. Can, yeah. We are not. We're not. We are human. Yeah. And we are, we can be easily susceptible to yeah. temptations. It's how we learn to manage them. The key thing here, sister, is to understand we have resources yeah. and it takes great courage. It's not shameful. It takes great yeah. courage to come and seek the yeah. support and help. And it's in a non-judgmental environment Definitely. as well. It's we so have the know. resources. Please access them. Definitely. And the wise words from Sister Barak, thank you so much um, you. again. And I pray that if anybody, if anyone is um, struggling, um, again, I, I gave um, some indication at the beginning of the show, there's the Muslim Youth Helpline. Youth Helpline. Please do approach the resources that are available and don't suffer alone. Um, again, inshallah, another morning, another chat. Um, and next up, we have um, Dr. Yasser Madani and another long topic. Pick. Imam Hussein Media Group is a virtual university that works on a global scale to spread the true message of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt's peace and blessings be upon them. Imam Hussein TV was established 10 years ago in the city of Esfahan, Iran. We work to cover all aspects of religion, Islamic jurisprudence, politics, philosophy and many more and aim to bring the public's attention to the righteous Islamic sect, Shia Islam. Our ultimate goal as a media group is to convey the interpretations of the Holy Quran as well as the traditions and knowledge of the Holy Prophet and his progeny, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon them. Our objectives are to protect and safeguard the Shia youth from the destructive impact of immoral ideologies standing up against injustice by documenting the oppression of Shia across the globe, as well as encouraging peace and unity amongst the Muslims. To reach our aims and serve the Muslim Ummah, we require a budget that would cover all the expenses for our productions, allowing us to work on different projects. Imam Hussein Media Group is a crowd-funded project. We have no sales nor do we charge for our services, we solely rely on monthly payments, financial contributions, donations, religious alms and generous gifts. The expenses of each production varies depending on the type of project and the style of filming. There are many elements to a production that requires time and capital. The producer must analyse the costs of the venue hire, equipment, transport, feature fees, set design, staff support and further additional costs. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family, narrated the best of people is he from whom people benefit. It is up to you to help the Muslim Ummah come together and help guide the youth in remaining on the correct path of Islam. To take part in this global conquest and to spread the message of Imam Hussein, peace and blessings be upon him, please visit www.imamhussein3.tv or give us a call on plus four four zero two zero three five one five zero one nine nine. You can also contact us via WhatsApp, Telegram, SMS or even email us on donate at imamhussein.tv. Let's work together hand in hand to elevate the faith of our Shia youth today. Yes, welcome back dear viewers of Imam Hussein TV um, to this particular show, Morning Barakah where in this particular segment, we're actually focusing on the, the lungs, um, in particular, um, the diseases affected with the lungs. And, and in previous, uh, sub, previous conversations, we've uh, focused on smoking, um, be it 
the, the, the cigarettes or the, the shisha or the e-cigarettes. Um, today we're going to be focusing more um, along uh, you know, the, the, the direct diseases associated with smoking and, and of course to discuss this as always for this particular aspect. Uh, our resident expert within this field, um, Dr. Saeed Yasser Madani, thank you so much for, for, for your time once again. Um, so yeah, Zara, we were, we were talking about actually before, before we went on air in terms of the, the most common kind of disease people associate mm. cigarettes or smoking with is, is lung cancer, yes. but actually there is, there's, more, there's more to mm. it than that. Sure. Uh, so uh, one of the most common lung conditions, uh, probably uh, after asthma, in terms of its prevalence and how common it is, is COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, and that by and large is a smoking related, smoking caused lung disease. It's very common, about 1.2 million people um, have confirmed COPD in the UK, so that's about 2% of the population and it's about um, uh, it's about 4% of those who are above the age of 45. Um, it's a combination of... Uh, and, th and that's just people that, n that we know are diagnosed with COPD. Yeah. So that's 1.2. There are uh, about another 2 million that we don't know that are undiagnosed to have yeah. COPD. So we think about 3 million people have COPD. Uh, so it's quite a lot of people. Um, and, and COPD consists of two conditions. One chronic bronchitis, which is inflammation of the airways. Um, and we talked about anatomy of the lungs in the first episode, tubes being the airways. And then emphysema is the other part of this condition, COPD, um, which is destruction of the air sacs, the alveoli, where okay. the major function of the lung happens, which is the gas transfer. We talked about this mm. again in yeah. the first episode. Um, so inevitably, people that have COPD have a mixture of both of these two together. Um, some people can have a bit of one more than the other, but in actual facts, in reality, people have chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So what are the symptoms? Or what, what, what do people go through when they have this So symptoms, symptoms are cough, a chronic cough. And it's not just a smoker's cough. Yeah. This is a persistent cough. Now, smokers can have a cough as well. It's often drier than people with COPD. People with COPD often bring phlegm up. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Not always, but that's, it's quite common for, for them to bring mm. phlegm up. Um, and breathlessness and wheeze. Remember we mentioned wheeze. Wheeze is a, is a, is a symptom of, of the tubes of the airways when the airways are tightened. Mm. So um, asthma is also a condition that causes wheeze because again it affects yeah. the tube. Yeah. So in bronchitis the tubes are narrowed. The difference with COPD and asthma is with asthma it's a variable disease. There's times when the airways are completely patent and open, other times it's narrowed. With COPD they're always narrowed and when you have an infection on top they get narrower. Mm. Okay so wheeze, breathlessness, cough and phlegm those are the conditions, those are, those are the symptoms. People with COPD are prone to chest infections, just like you get asthma attacks, they have flare-ups or, or attacks of their COPD, where they normally, due to an infection, sometimes environmental triggers, but more commonly due to infection, which can be virus or bacterial, mm. they have a flare-up of their chest, and they need a course of steroids and antibiotics for that. So we talked a lot about um, the, the, the time frame where you can actually um, find out after 20, 30 years the effects of, of, of smoking. Mm. Um, with this particular condition, is it, is it something that happens after maybe five years, six years, seven years of smoking, 10 years, 20? Yeah, so um, I, I don't think frame? we know for sure how many years, but there's a lag. There's a lag. It doesn't happen straight away, just you start smoking and straight away you develop no, no, this condition. Course, yeah. No, the lag, lag of a, you know, several decades, probably more than a decade, okay. I would say, you know, tw tw 20 years at least. Uh, and so we rarely diagnose this condition in anyone below the age of you know, 40, 45. Okay. Um, people can have emphysema for other reasons, which we'll talk about later yeah. if we have time. But um, normally uh, this condition happens in someone that started smoking in their 20s, for example, has continued smoking heavily, and then in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, develops this condition. Right. So there is a lag. Mm. So in terms of the actual condition as well, because what you mentioned in terms of the coughing and, and, and the wheezing, is this kind of reversible? Can you, can you just... 
get something to sort it out. So it's not it's not a reversible disease, unfortunately. Mm. And the damage that's been done in the lungs, you know, the anatomical geographic structural damage, the emphysema, the destruction of the alveoli. It's, it's not, not something the body can repair itself. It's not reversible. So, so you, um, sorry. Go ahead, no, please. Um, I was going to say that you mentioned about the antibiotics being treatment um, mm. as a form of treatment. Is there anything else that people can? Yeah, so antibiotics to treat the flare up, but the long term management of the condition is, you know, there's like a pyramid of, of, of treatments uh, and at the top are the things that are the most effective things, mm -hmm. which are actually the cheapest things. Mm. So getting the flu jab, influenza vaccination and the pneumonia vaccination is very important. It doesn't treat the condition, yeah. right? The condition is there, yeah. uh, it doesn't reverse the condition, but it tries to limit um, or prevent those infections which can be fatal or damaging in the presence of yeah. someone who's got COPD, mm. all right? There's other things such as stopping smoking and smoking cessation, extremely yeah. important. Probably the only thing that, that reduces the damage, the ongoing damage to the lungs, yeah. right? Because okay. we know that it's a irreversible condition. We think that in many people it's a progressive condition, but mm -hmm. if you stop smoking, it may not necessarily progress. We now know in, in more recent studies, um, but it won't regress either, unfortunately. Mm. But the only thing we can really do to do that is to stop smoking, to either slow down the progression or stop the progression. Um, and then other things like keeping very active. So yeah. people who are affected because of breathlessness by this condition, there's a, a program called pulmonary rehabilitation, eight week program twice a week where people go and do aerobic exercises and they're taught to do that in a gym by a physiotherapist. This is all under the NHS, the GP can refer to that. Every local locality will have this service. And in addition to the exercises, um, which people should continue doing at home after this, uh, then there's also an educational part to this program, so pulmonary rehabilitation. And then there's medical treatments, there's pharmacotherapy, so there's inhalers. Right. Mm. Again, they don't reverse the condition, but they help to reduce the infections, reduce the flare-ups, and improve the symptoms and quality of life. So when it comes to, obviously, when it comes to the, the respiratory diseases, um, smoking is obviously one of the major causes for that. Um, specifically when it comes to emphysema or COPD, is smoking the only thing that can cause that? Or no, that that's a very good question. We say about somewhere in the region of 95 to 98% of, of emphysema is due to smoking, mm. but actually there's, there are other things that can, other environmental things that can, that can do it. Um, cadmium uh, and, and coal, in, in, in the case of coal miners, mm. um, the dust that they come into contact with can cause COPD as well. These are less well studied and less well recognized uh, and much less common. Mm. But then there's a condition which is called alpha and T1 trypsin deficiency, right. which is a protein um, in the human body which is produced in the liver. If there's a deficiency of that condition, then there's, that causes emphysema and destruction of the, uh, of the alveoli. alveoli. And these people get emphysema earlier in life than right. COPD. So right. by the age they're in their 30s, they could be diagnosed with emphysema. Wow. Right? So these people, it's even more important to not smoke than these mm. people. Because mm. if they have that deficiency of this protein and they smoke, they're more likely to do even more damage more to them. What's the long-term prognosis of people that develop an irreversible condition like COPD? Yeah, so that's, that's actually a very good question. Um, it's very difficult to prognosticate in conditions such as COPD and other conditions that cro cause chronic organ failure, mm. unlike cancer. It's, it's much easier in cancer to say to someone, look, based on how extensive your cancer is, you have X number of months or months okay. or weeks or years. Okay. With these, it's much more difficult to prognosticate and give specific figures. Um, it all depends on how severe the COPD is. Mm. Um, and the things that we look at in terms of defining the severity of COPD are how frequently people get infections, how frequently they are admitted to hospital, how disabled they are. Yeah. Some people get so breathless that they can only walk within the house. Some people could become housebound. Wow. I mean, I, I don't want to scare people, but I see this because I'm yeah. a lung specialist and also yeah. because I'm a hospital physician. Yeah. So though I see the worst of the worst <laughs> mm. yeah. rather than the GP, for example. GPs also look after these patients and they refer yeah. them to yeah. us. Um, but I, I see the more severe end of the spectrum. Right. 
So people that are literally housebound, people that are, have developed respiratory failure and require oxygen all the time, wow. or even a machine to breathe at night to help them breathe. Um, you know, th these people are coming towards the end of life. Really? They probably have several years to live. And it could require one pneumonia and they could die. So actually the prognosis in people with very advanced COPD is poor. And you know, we have systems in place, such as referral to palliative care, who are in the community to help us manage people's symptoms and you know, avoidance admission teams to try to manage people in the community and COPD teams. Because COPD very much is a condition that is amenable to treatment within the community. Mm. Um, so we've had discussions um, about sort of organ transplant, you know, mm. um, how, is that something as a treatment as well for us? Yeah, yeah. So the problem with COPD, um, though, mm. is by the time they're that severe, yeah. they've kind of um, missed the boat to be transplanted because really? they've become so, so deconditioned. By yeah. deconditioned, I mean they've become so frail and so weak because of their condition. Uh, you know, that vicious cycle of I'm breathless, therefore I spend most of the time in bed and chair. I don't go out, therefore the whole body becomes weak, yeah. mm. the muscles become weak. That going through a major operation, yeah. such as a lung transplant, be fatal. is probably not in their best interest and yeah. probably will have harm. Mm. So yeah. they'll, they'll receive a pair of lungs which go to someone else that could save their lives, yeah. Yeah. who is better candidate for a lung transplant than mm. these people. So these people often don't even get referred to lung transplant. Wow. Now we are referring more people to lung transplant you know, mm. th than previous years. People with emphysema uh, that is due to alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency often get diagnosed earlier and are younger. Mm. So these people get transplanted more often than COPD patients. Mm. But I have done lung transplant, as, in fact, last year as a, in, in, a, in, in a, one of, we only have five UK adult lung transplant centers and I've worked in one of those last year. And, and we did use to transplant COPD patients. So if they get referred to us probably before the age of 70, then we can consider lung mm. transplantation. Wow. So it just makes you wonder, does it have any yeah. implications? And you know, yeah. even if you went for an organ donor, um, for donor, but you need yeah. to have the match and how important it is yeah. to donate. Um, uh, and if they lungs. continue smoking, then they, we don't transplant them. No. But it's, it's very interesting. So because, because a, lot of, a lot of the times, you know, people uh, who hear stories of smoking and, the, and mm. the, you know, look, it's a message to the, to the viewers and probably to myself as well. If you want to live a life um, where you're almost bed bound, you can't really move out the, the house without you know, yeah. failing to breathe, and you've got these all these little machines trying just to keep you alive, then you know go ahead. But w from first hand experience, from an expert in, in 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 this field, he's telling me that, well, he's telling us that he, he sees the end of the ex end of the spectrum. Yeah. He's seeing the, the the end results of smoking over and continuous. And it's low quality start, you know. And it's the, it's the the quality of life is is almost yeah, it's quite nothing. sad actually. It's quite sad, but I mean. It's one of the commonest conditions that I treat COPD, mm. uh, and it's by and large due to cigarette smoke. You know, yeah. by and large, and I can say prevent, almost always. Yeah, you, you know. could prevent it. You could stop. And it's completely preventable. Yeah. And and unfortunately, people that smoke and and you know, whatever justifications they have for it, if they saw this aspect, yes. you Would know, they, yeah. you know, there's one video that I love sharing on Facebook because Facebook now recycles videos that you've used three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And every time it tells me on this day you use this video, yeah, yeah, I yeah. share it again, yeah. is, is the black lungs from, a, from someone who d obviously died and, uh, and the lungs are completely black from wow. previous smoking. You know, if you actually saw what's happening inside your body, yeah. if you saw those people who have severe emphysema, severe lung disease and how they're living, you probably wouldn't smoke. You know, um, and that's, we talked about Shisha in the previous episode. I don't think it's all about raising awareness so people can make an informed decision. Yeah. I don't think people know how harmful tobacco and the other chemicals and toxins are. Yeah. I'm not but saying that everyone yeah. develops emphysema from smoking. Yeah. There are some smokers that, for some reason, probably genetic factors, they don't have the predisposition, genetic predisposition, get away, but no one can know that. Yeah. There's no blood test or, you know, a test that I, where I can tell you it's fine, you smoke, mm. you're not going to get emphysema. Yeah, yeah. Th mm. That doesn't exist. And, you know, and it doesn't eliminate the harmful effects of smoking on the rest of the body. Yeah. We've talked about how harmful smoking is to the blood vessels, to the heart, to the brain, to everything else. Yeah. You know, not just the lungs. So you know, there's no win-win with smoking. There no is way. no win-win. Yes, I appreciate there's lots of stress in life. And people use it as a and shisha. And people use it as a way of de-stressing. 
but we have to think about alternatives, really. We have to consider other things. And I think it's important to look at, you know, when you're sort of talking about informed decisions, and it's about really understanding that what you're doing to your body, because although we can't see it, it doesn't matter, you know, that harm is occurring, and you can perfectly prevent it, but then, you know, it's not just, oh, I need to distress, it's Friday night and I want to go for a smoke, oh, we'll see what happens. Really, these are life-changing um, implications, and really to get to that point where it's irreversible would be such a shame. Um, yeah. And um, for anybody who's been in hospitals and visited, and obviously mm. you're working, seeing these people, it's soul destroying to see how people yeah. suffer, really. Um, and we're fortunate what we have the hand to. Yeah, I mean, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a present. Exactly. Yeah. And the same way that we need to look after our souls through dua and salat and what have you, we have to look after our bodies. Definitely. Allah has given us this. And, you know, you can make easily in a, in a, an argument that actually what we're doing is harming ourselves. And would the, would the Holy Prophet and the Ahl Bayt, you know, approve of, yeah. of this? Definitely. Had we known, and we do know, Nowadays we do, maybe a hundred years we didn't know. But now that we know that this is harmful, can we justify, you know, d using these substances? It's a hard question and I think it's a hard topic, but I think, yeah. again, people need to know the implications and, you know, and decide. But really, it's quite frightening from hearing, but informative. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Um, Once again, any thoughts, any ideas, any questions, please do send us through in the, um, um, the email on your screen. Um, hopefully we can send some sort of response um, directly from Dr. Yasser as well. Once again, thank you, Doctor, for the time. And we have um, mentioned, um, Doctor has mentioned about the smoking cessation service yeah. in the NHS, so please do log on to their website. Um, if you Google it. Um, yeah, so www.nhs.uk forward slash smoke free. Smoke free. Smoke free. Yeah. yeah. Smoke free. Okay. On that note, uh, we're going to be joined by Sayyid Ali Nawab uh, for some jurisprudential issues uh, and some actionable insights um, in that field. So please do join us after the break. Thank you. <laughs> The Hadith is Sharif Ma'asum Imam al Sajjad. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given my uncle Abbas a maqam such that on the day of judgment, all the shuhada and the siddiqeen will wish they had the maqam of Abu al Fadil. And the Imam did not leave an exception for anyone within the kawn. The exception that we know is Ahlul Bayt through Ahkam Akli. your time and of mm -hmm. course now we've reached the, the final part of the show um, upon which we are looking to delve into some of the key issues that are not really spoken about in modern society and here to um, to really delve into those topics uh, really appreciate your time uh, Assalamu alaikum Sayyid uh, Ali and Nawab Assalamu Sayyid. alaikum how are you? Sayyid, okay? how are you? I'm good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you, sister. Thank you for having me. Um, so in, we yeah. So in in previous <coughs> in our previous sessions, we talked a lot about um, sort of uh, family life, family law, um, and uh, and also remembering the dead. I think uh, in one of the ep one of the episodes today um, is something which is also quite important, and it's it's, uh, it's something which is often happens. But not a lot of people give importance to it. Yeah. It's, it's missing prayers and, and fasting. Yeah. Because um, a lot of the a lot of the cases, oh, I've missed prayer. It's fine. Yeah. You know, I'll, I might do it, be able to do something to to, you know, to make up for it. Or the fasting is, yeah, I'll do or it next year. Or perhaps people become religious later in their lives yeah. and they missed in the earlier part of their life. It's various reasons. But yeah. the, I so think we need to know about the importance of actually. So from a jurisprudential mm. point point of view, I mean, in terms of missing and pra missing prayers and, and 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 fasting, is it is it wajib to, to make up the salah? How does it work? Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, offer my aza and my condolences for the mm. uh, shahada and martyrdom of Imam Al Kathim, uh, Musa ibn Jafar alayhi salam, and as we see. Um, Thousands, if not millions, of uh, pilgrims are going towards the shrine. Yeah. Uh, in uh, in Kathmi, uh, inshallah, we are given the opportunity to, to visit uh, the holy sites uh, of the Sima. Uh, regarding uh, missing the prayers or missing, uh, for some reason, not fasting, and doing the qadha of these acts specifically, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has made it compulsory. That's one, if uh, they missed, for example, praying Salat al-Subh, 
and we take Salat Subh as an example because it's um, mm. widely common that, for example, individuals do not wake up mm -hmm. uh, because of um, sleeping late or being awake until, until uh, late hours of, of the night. Um, and there are, unfortunately, there are individuals who even miss uh, prayers in the afternoon or in the evening mm -hmm. uh, as a result uh, of their uh, work. Uh, timetable or their uh, commitments elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, of course, these are not uh, uh, reasons for one to miss their salah, but if they were to miss salah, they did not wake up in, in time or pray in time of the salah, they are, are always encouraged uh, uh, to re-pray, to do the qadha. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, there are spiritual uh, gains that one would gain if they prayed on time. Um, uh, or uh, the beginning of the of the adhan, for example, uh, which they will miss. For example, mm -hmm. Salat al-Subh, if you uh, wake up for morning prayers mm -hmm. and you stay awake until sunrise, mm -hmm. uh, or um, yeah, sunrise, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has specifically made that time, uh, the time of uh, Salat al-Subh and sunrise, for the malaika to come down with the, the blessings allocated to you for that day. Mm. Some people uh, they uh, wake up at nine or ten in the in the morning when the sun's out and everyone's gone out mm -hmm. uh, to work. They've missed Salat al-Subh and they have also missed the blessings yes. of that day. Mm -hmm. So it is wajib upon uh, every mukallaf uh, to pray on time. And if not, uh, for some reason they've missed their salah, they have to do the qadha. Okay. Yeah. What? Um, is there a difference between people who regularly miss their prayers um, and then what, how will they make up? And is it, is it more of the attitude of disregarding the importance of prayer rather than somebody who perhaps missed a prayer one off in the morning, afternoon? Again, um, if this is a, a repetitive mm -hmm. um, happening, then there is definitely something wrong. Right. Either in the timing or... Uh, if they have a problem waking up for Salat al-Subha, they should uh, ask uh, family members or mm. those who are residing with them to wake them up or setting numerous alarms, for example. Mm. I'm not, I'm, I don't know, doing anything to wake them up. And if they are not praying their prayers on time uh, that, they should, the, that they should be praying on, then there is a, uh, something... Uh, uh, is, is missing from the chain, right. let's say, of Iman and faith. Right. Because they're not taking Salah mm. seriously, they're taking it lightly. Yeah. And um, this is uh, basically Iman and faith is all based on the, the, the religious uh, yeah. acts and the prayers and the fasting. So we're looking at missing the fasting and prayer in this world. The impact will be in the next, won't it? Because obviously, I mean, there will be impact Of course, here Allah as well. subhanahu wa ta'ala has made uh, salah, for example, wajib, mm. compulsory. Uh, Allah says, uh, this is Islam, and one of the things, one of the pillars uh, that you should be following is salah in Furu al deen mm. So, if you miss it, you don't receive the blessings in this life, mm. and in the Akhirah, when they come to judge you, they open your book and they see in the prayer section, there isn't much written because with Salah comes the blessings of Salah. Yeah. There is an angel allocated for Salah that will come in front of you in the shape of either a beautiful angel or a, an angel that will, en will make fear enter your life mm -hmm. and your soul and the hereafter. And they come, the angel comes to you if you were an individual who protected Salah and you protected the sanctity of, of prayers, they will come to you and they will say, Hafidhtani Hafidhakallah. You looked after me, you protected me, you prayed me on time. I will protect you and I will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you in that uh, bumpy ride until one reaches the everlasting place in the paradise. But uh, vice versa, if you did not look after your Salah, if you did not, if you did not take Salah mm. seriously, mm. the angel will come in the shape of a, a, a very frightening mm. um, creation and will say, ضَيَّعْتَنِي ضَيَّعَكَ Allah." You did not take me seriously. You lost me. Mm. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, 
lose you. So on that Do note, look at you. On, on that note, and, and just following on from a previous discussion that we had in, in terms of remembering the dead and how we can, um, you know, send supplications and prayers and stuff. Um, what happens when when you as a person dies and you have missing salah or missing missing fasts? How how does how does that work? If the family members they know or they knew that the deceased did not have, for example, a good part of their life, they did not pray. Yeah. Or they had one shahar Ramadan or two, two Ramadans and they did not fast. Mm -hmm. They should, the eldest son mm -hmm. has the uh, responsibility legally, Islamically. Islamic, okay. Islamically. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the responsibility lies on the eldest son to take care of that. Either he himself does the qadha of... Uh, the, the prayers, we pay someone else. or he financially uh, supports someone to commit to doing the qadha of the fasting mm -hmm. and, and the, the salah. And in terms... Of course, of wants to try in their lifetime, before they, they depart from course, this life, yeah. to okay. do the qadha of fasting what, and yeah. salah. What if they don't know how much salah they've missed or fasting? Um, the, the ahkam or the hukum is, uh, as mentioned in the books of the ulama, is that they should sit down. And say, okay, I know there is a minimum to it, and I know there is a maximum. Mm -hmm. So they always stick to the maximum. They say, for example, I know I didn't pray for a month. That's the least. Or uh, I missed prayers for f three months, for example. So they should take three months as an example, and they should pray for Come three on, months. Just in case. Yeah, yeah. just in case. Yeah. And for fasting, they say, uh, as some for precautionary reasons as well, they, knew, they know that they, they fasted. And they know that they prayed all their life. There are some uh, religious individuals in their will. They write that I want my family members to pay for uh, fasting of one year, for example, and for, for salah of one year. Just in case? Just in case. Maybe one year my mm. fasting wasn't um, as I wanted it to be. Or maybe um, um, when I was praying, mm. I didn't have full concentration or my prayer was not accepted. Yeah. Uh, so I don't face any problems mm. in the hereafter. So um, again, Salah and Siyam uh, sometimes is mentioned in the wills of Mu'minin and Mu'minat and mm. sometimes is not. But if the, if the children, if the family members, even if they knew that their father was someone who um, was praying on time and did the fasting uh, for the sake that he is happy mm. and he is blessed in his grave they should pay someone to at least do one year's worth of salah and, and one, one year for w worth of fasting and if somebody and hajj as well of so course I was, I was about to say yeah, yeah. does that um, I was actually going to say the ziara and the hajj um, if you they didn't, parents perhaps, somebody else in your family didn't get opportunity to perform their wajib hajj, then it's in something that... Yeah, the answer lies in this story that I'm going to narrate to you, that mm. one of the, one of the uh, believers passed away. And they saw um, their relatives in the, in, the, in the dream. Or their relatives saw them in the dream. And they saw that they were in a bad state. And they asked them, why are you in a bad state? Did not Ahlul Bayt not come by to your side because we believe when we pass away, uh, Ahlul Bayt they come and visit us or mm. they intercede for us. That's before Judgment Day in Alam al Barzakh. So this deceased says to their family members, there is one thing that I am being punished for, and that is because I did not go to Hajj and I was able to go to Hajj. Mm. And they brought me in front of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al Mu'mineen, and he was uh, looking at my book. And he said, I can't do anything for you. Fatima Tizara, I said, he said, I called upon Lady Fatima and I said, if you can intercede for me. Lady Fatima came to Amir al Mumineen and said, He is one of our lovers, he is mm. one of our followers. Is there anything we can do to help him? Amir al Mumineen says, he, He's missed one of the important pillars of Islam. He was able to go to Hajj, but he did not. So Fatima Tizara salam, faces Imam al Mahdi, and this is all in Alam al Ru'ya. Mm. Lady Fatima faces Imam al-Mahdi and says, Oh my son Mahdi, now you are alive, you are the Imam of his time. If you are able to go to Hajj this year and dedicate your Hajj for the sake of this moment. Mm. So here, Ahlul Bayt salam, they will intercede, whether it was for Salah, Psalm, Hajj, but that doesn't mean that we should neglect, yes, yeah. we shouldn't do it. Yeah. But if one 
uh, is able to go to Hajj in his lifetime and does not and he passes away mm -hmm. again it's the responsibility of the family mm -hmm. the eldest son to pay either he himself goes to Hajj in, on behalf of his father or pay someone to, to mm -hmm. go to Hajj and perform pilgrimage for him I think it's uh, quite scary how we neglect our wajib you're mm -hmm. saying this big it um, has its effects yeah. it has its negative effects in this life and it has its effects in the hereafter it, as well. Can it be as significant as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala denying you entrance to heaven, for example? Of course, because it's, this is one of the wajibat. And mm. when, we say, when we say wajib, which means that if you don't do this wajib, you've, you've for example, missed the train and the train is yeah. gone. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. And um, it's one of the things that will add to the many other things that will make you go into the he mm. heaven. And that's why it's so important for loved ones, family members to, to remember mm. the dead just in case. Because can you you can imagine a desperate situation where yeah. you, for example, will need maybe one or two months of salah, and the son hasn't hasn't taken care of that. Assuming and that we're we're talking mostly about the hereafter now, but yeah. in the in the lifetime, it is very important that uh, that we stick to our salah because yeah. we will see the the advantages and the, the benefits of of uh, salah of psalm uh, because it will cleanse our souls. It will continuously protect us and, and and we are refrained or we are saved from entering into difficult situations yeah. and it, this, this will us, yeah, of course it will protect mm -hmm. us and our families yeah. because the malaika they will not enter a house if the inhabitants of that house do not pray yeah. or if there is one person in that house that does not pray yeah. the malaika will, will not come and protect that household there's um, a couple of minutes left and what I wanted to touch on if it's okay of course yeah um, is that there are people within our school of thought who say that the um, so, and I've travelled with people, seen it's time of azan um, and people don't pray and they say and it's not on time and perhaps they're doing something else and they say but the intercession of Imam Hussein is enough. He will give us that. How would you respond to that in it's terms of? It's, it's a it's a problem that we have been made aware of. Unfortunately, it, it does exist, but. Um, the responsibility, firstly and foremostly, lies upon the the, the ulama and the community to uh, educate those individuals for the importance of salah. Because mm. if they were to be educated from a young and early age, uh, when salah and psalm and all of these acts became wajib upon them, they wouldn't have taken this lightly. And of course, um, there is this misconception again, and there is this thing going around like a virus that says that uh, for the sake, uh, for the fact that you love Ahlul Bayt, you cry and mourn for Imam Hussein, you do matam mm -hmm. and azah for Imam Hussein, uh, Imam Hussein will do, will do mm -hmm. intercession for you, and they will come and save you from the mm -hmm. hellfire. And if, 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 if that is the case, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have said, uh, from the beginning, yeah. the lovers of yeah. Ali ibn Abi Talib, they are exempt from doing salah. Or he wouldn't have created salah in the first yeah. place yeah. if Ahlul Bayt were the ones that uh, saved us. Good point. So here, salah is something, and, and, and remembering Ahlul Bayt is something else. And one completes the other. Mm. Mm -hmm. Salah completes the fact that you are remembering Ahlul Bayt, and Ahlul Bayt are the ones that call people to, to do salah, and they advise and encourage mm. their mu'mineen to do salah Ali ibn Abi Talib died in the in the in the hala in yeah. the in the position of salah Rasulullah alayhi salawatullahi alayhi he was the one that um, endured mm. many hardship because he was calling people to salah and and, mm. and psalm and hajj so Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam teach us that whether it was in good times or bad times whether you are you know doing another act of worship still you have to Practice okay. salah. You still you have to practice fasting and hajj. I think the final. Um, I, I always remember people. You know, we cry for Imam Hussein, but one of his biggest lessons on the day of Ashura is the fact that he stops in midway yeah. and prays. Yeah. And we are not emulating that basic. You yeah. know that it's that is how important it is that whatever is happening, the circumstances, prayer is prayer. And may Allah give us um, the blessings to continue um, to Shana. perform our wajibat. And thank you so much for. Shana. Enlightening us today, say Thank you. Thank you. Have a blessed yeah. Friday. Yeah, uh, just to echo the words of, of Zara, we really, really appreciate your time, Sayyid. Thank of you course. very much. Um, 
we very much look forward to seeing you on our next episode uh, of uh, Morning Barakah for now. Um, uh, inshallah, uh, your Fridays are blessed. And we once again send our condolences to the Muslim world on the uh, martyrdom of Imam Musa al-Kazim. And on that note, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.